Hi, this is Paul, and I want to continue with my conversation on the resurrection, and I'm going to bring in C.S. Lewis's last chapter in his book, Miracles, on miracles of the new creation. So yesterday and last night, I did kind of a deep dive into everything that I could find from Peterson on the resurrection. And as I'll do when I get into Lewis, I don't want to just simply focus on the physicality of the resurrection, although that, I think, is crucial. Because as Lewis notes, when we're talking about the resurrection, we're talking about a lot more than the first five minutes of what happened on that Easter Sunday morning. And I think this is a problem. This is part of the problem for Peterson, and this is a part of the problem for the listeners, and this is part of the challenge of understanding that. I had done a previous series going back through this five-part commentary that Peterson did around Easter. And if you remember my conversation with Peterson that you can find on my channel, he was staying in the same place. And he told me in my conversation with him that he was in fact, that he was in fact um, making this five-part series. And so I re-listened to it last night. And the last section is part of what he wrote in the Times of London, an edited version of it. And I think for the most part, that section, which is a fairly long section of the video, gets, he, he mostly stays with the symbolism aspect where he's clearly most comfortable with the resurrection. I'll just play the tail end of it because it's, it's indicative of the entire, of the entire section. Christ is symbolically the way and the truth of life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Embracing the process of voluntary death and rebirth that is identical with psychological development means determining to move forward and upward despite the horrors of life. It means as well, symbolically speaking, rejuvenating the dead father or rescuing him from stagnation and deterioration in the eternal underworld. Forthright individual confrontation with the unknown renews the individual but also catalyzes cultural revitalization. This is the essence of Christian ritual and belief articulated as a psychological principle. We must identify with that part of ourselves that is always stretching beyond what we currently know and has the faith to let go of old certainties so that new patterns of being can be brought into place. Again, this is the, he, he says this, in many, many different ways over and over and over and over and over again in this last part of the video. And, you know, it, when I, I don't say that to disparage it, this is what we do to learn. We say it in a different way, then we look at it from another angle and we say it in a different way and we, we try and get around the thing. But, but again, the, the emphasis here is, is primarily on the symbolic and, and he's got some stoicism mixed in with it too that you'll hear in a minute. It is through identification with the process symbolized by Easter that we are each redeemed and our culture revivified and salvaged. Now, now that's an interesting phrase right there. I'm going to play it again. We are Easter. It is through identification with the process symbolized by Easter that we are each redeemed and our culture revivified and salvaged. So again here, it's, it's the symbolic element of this, and it's the... It's the His admonition through this and, and through the rest of his work is that we, in a sense, incarnate the symbolic in our lives. And so it's, it's, it's one thing to talk about cleaning your room. It's another thing to clean your room. And you only bear the, you only gain the benefits when you do clean your room. In, in a sense, you, you make, you put your room in alignment with the order that you want to see travel out through your life. We are all the slaves of Pharisees and lawyers, of those who place dogma above spirit at the cost of spirit. We are all subject to betrayal by ourselves and by all those who surround us. We are all facing extinction in the most torturous of manners. But there is a spirit within us with sufficient courage to confront the true horrors of existence forthrightly. And, and this is part of a, a little video that he put on his channel from a longer interview with another individual that, I, I, oh, I can show it. 
So the video I'm referring to is this video that he that he you love made. Someone. You love them not only despite their fragility, but also because of it. They wouldn't be who they were. Also being prone yeah. to pain and antidote to their vulnerability. He talks about the weakness and the vulnerability. Well, that's a horrible situation. And then he talks about the strength. I'm armed for the task. Well, that's that's a great thing for people to know. I think the fact that we're armed for the task is even more true than the fact that life is catastrophe contaminated by malevolence. Okay, and actually when this video came out, a friend of mine who was horrified by it, which was very interesting, this isn't a friend from my Jordan Peterson era, this is a friend from a number of years ago, saw this video, I've, of course seen a little bit of Jordan Peterson, saw this, this is horrible. And and some Christians are gonna have this 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 kind of reaction, and it and it has a lot to do with our culture now in terms of, the divine savior of the state and in, in, in a sense part of the religious ethos of our culture is that we are weak and the state is strong and our religious devotion to the state is that which will save us and this is part of my this is part of my is hatred too strong a word this is part of my this is part of the reason i think that the state can be idolatrous and in fact in many ways is for this certain part of the culture and this idolatry of the state is actually a very long running theme in the bible and i and what peterson gets from fry in terms of the old to the new testament from the state to the individual is a is a helpful observation but where that falls short in peterson where i don't think he's fully appreciated the new testament message is that the relationship between Jesus as the divine individual is not disconnected from the state because this is this is why Jesus takes on the the phrase son of man as his how he designates himself in the gospels that's not only a cagey way of evading uh, evading this unwanted attention too early from roman authorities but it it then appropriates daniel 7 into Jesus ministry that Jesus in fact is establishing a kingdom that will have no end so he is the king of kings and in Jesus the you know Jesus announces the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven or life of the age which is the translation of of eternal life or Paul in the Pauline corpus in Christ in the Johannine corpus light and life and you know all of these more symbolic elements in the Johannine corpus. So the 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 message of Peterson here is that the world is big and bad, and but and it is scary. But you have the strength to overcome it. And this is this is one of my critiques of Peterson in that sometimes we have the strength to overcome elements of the world but in the gospels it is jesus himself who overcomes the world in this world you will have trouble but be not afraid i have overcome the world and it is if we part of what's difficult about talking about these things is that we want to talk about multiple things at once without removing the validity of each element and so is the resurrection symbolic yes but it is is it merely symbolic no but the our appropriation of the symbolism of the resurrection in our lives is not really in competition with jesus with what this says about jesus himself okay and and that there there are many cases where Peterson here with the death, you know, the dying of the old self, and this again is this is New Testament literature. This has been in theology for a very long time. Mortification, the dying of the old self. The Apostle Paul talks about taking off the old self, and he uses the metaphor of clothing and put on the new self. Clothes make the man. This, this is all worked through in the New Testament again and again and again on, on different angles and in different ways. But there are times when, in fact, we face dragons that we lose to. And in fact, in this world, all of us do, in fact, lose. We, we have no 
weapon against the age of decay. Now, what do I mean by the age of decay? Those of you who've heard some of my videos have heard me use this, and especially if you go back over my sermons over the years, you'll hear age of decay a lot. Everything in this world breaks down, and a key element of the resurrection of Jesus Christ this comes through in, in 1 Corinthians 15, is that he is raised to no longer decay. In, in a sense, the age of decay comes with the rebellion in the garden, and it's in the resurrection that the age of decay is undone. And, and all of us might have great strength to overcome all kinds of barriers, but each of us meet opponents and each of us meet enemies that we cannot overcome. And that final great enemy is death. And that's exactly what the resurrection is designed to engage, that the final enemy has been overcome. And yes, this is symbolic, and it does in fact scale down to your challenge at work, or your challenge in a relationship, or your challenge in another area of your life. And you are stronger than you know, that's true. But there are also enemies against which you cannot stand. And this is where the reality of Jesus, and I'm going to get into a little bit later, the multifaceted reality of the resurrection, that which is most real and that which is most true must be most real and most true at every layer and level of reality that there is. Which is why I assert with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 that... It must be physical and more that in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we don't just simply have a symbol of the phoenix, but in fact, we have the renovation of heaven and earth that begins at that moment and continues to ripple out like ripples on a pond. And this is where we're going to go with C.S. Lewis. But I get preaching and then I, I, uh, I get distracted. So let's let uh, the good Dr. Uh, J.B.P. finish up here information, even death, that such confrontation catalyzes to occur and to leap forward renewed. How is it that life might prevail in the face of death and hell, with arms open, embracing its fate? Now there's some stoicism in there. Now, I don't say that as a criticism, because Christianity is the kind of there are there are stoic elements in Christianity and there's stoic there are commonality there's some commonalities between Christianity and ideas in stoicism just like you will find commonalities in in many many other religions and and I think part of that is because truth is truth is the core it's the center and and any religion that has endured will have probably some rebellion in it definitely have some rebellion in it. It'll have some rebellion in it. It'll have some error in it. But there's probably also a truth that it's getting at. Any religion that has endured that has no truth probably couldn't endure because it would just it would just be thrown away because truth is that kind of thing. It is, it is the thing that does not give. It is the thing that does not bend. It is the floor that you cannot get beneath. Okay? So, so Stoicism has an element of that, and this is correct here, but this is where, again, Peterson sounds Stoic. We are all fallen creatures, and we all know it. We are all separated from what should be and thrown into the world of death and despair. We are all brutally crucified on the cross that is the reality of life itself. To rebel against that fate merely worsens it, transforming what could be mere tragedy into something indistinguishable from hell. Although there are times to rebel against it. And, and of course, Peterson exemplifies this in his life and some of his other agendas. He is rebelling against, you know, he's rebelling against the error and you don't, you don't live in this world. To, to fight against the dragon is to rebel against something. You just have to figure out when and where and how and against which you rebel. So this isn't this isn't complete resignation to the suffering. And in fact, if you read the the, the canonical story of Jesus on his way to the cross, he goes down to Jerusalem, and this is most clear in the Gospel of Luke, he goes down to Jerusalem willingly, and his disciples don't want him to go because they all understand that. Now this is in some ways like the resignation with which with 
with which we face things in our lives. But but Jesus goes down to Jerusalem, Jerusalem in predator mode. But you can see in he is going down to face it. But he will he will face it willingly. And and this is where all of these elements it's so hard to language this stuff that's where all of these elements come together and so peterson is is showing and, and that's why i don't think peterson quite has the resurrection right in his in this uh resignation because when jesus goes to the cross it's quite clear in all of the conversations including his conversation with pilate that jesus is not resigning himself to this Jesus is is going into the day of the Lord. Jesus is going into the day of the Lord, and we'll get into that a little bit when we get into when we get into Lewis. To argue bitterly and despair around the deathbed of a loved one, to take a single example, is to turn all the pain. And, and again, at the deathbed, there. Consciousness always wants us to simplify things into one or maybe two sides. At the death of a loved one, on one hand, you get to the point, and I've been here many times as a pastor, you get to the point that you realize the age of decay has had its way, that death is coming. And so at, at this point, it is proper to relinquish and resign. But, but we always do so also with the same anger and fury and tears that Jesus brought to the tomb of Lazarus. And you can read about that in John chapter 11. When Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus, he, he, he weeps and he yells because he knows that death, you know, I said pretty soon Mr. Reagan will, pretty soon Mr. Reagan will probably edit and present my interview with him. And that's going to be controversial because my, I know a lot of my audience is politically conservative, and I might not be as politically conservative as you, but yet on other things, I'm very conservative because he asked me about homosexuality. And I said that I believe that God's design for human sexuality is between a man and a woman. I also believe God's design for human life is not death. And so when Jesus stands before the tomb of Lazarus, he is, he is angry and he weeps. And, and all of these, the, the, te the text is very interesting because all of these discordant emotions come right into that moment facing the tomb. And then he looks into the tomb and he says, Lazarus, come out. But this isn't the resurrection. This is, in a sense, um, this isn't the resurrection. And we're going to talk about this again when we get to Lewis. This isn't exactly what we mean when we talk about the resurrection. I have to sneeze. So again, I'm interrupting the doctor. This is going to be a long video if I keep this up. Pain of death and loss into something far worse. To accept instead? Is that simultaneously to transcend? It's certainly courage and truth and perhaps even love. And these three forces are something to behold. Are they more powerful than despair and the desire for vengeance? That is the Christian suggestion. And the Christian command? To act out the proposition that courage and truth and love are more powerful than death and despair, and to accept what transpires as a consequence. That's right. Right there. That's really true. That's right. That's, that's, that's the Christian life. And now this is predicated upon the belief that, again, I, I looked for the, if someone wants to, if someone wants to do me a favor, go through Dave Rubin and Eric Weinstein and find where Weinstein in that conversation basically says, you have to know everything's going to be okay to do this. And, and what Eric Weinstein doesn't have, to the best of my knowledge, is the is the fact of the revela of the resurrection upon which to wager our lives in this world where we know we will all lose them. To, in the words of the Apostle Paul, to pour out our lives for that which is true and good and right in love. That's what the resurrection has to offer. Now, 
one of the really one of the really good conversations with Peterson was by this this Roman Catholic uh, I don't know radio show or podcaster or however you wanted to uh, Patrick Coffin. And, and this was a really good, this was a really good conversation. And some of what Peterson said here was, I think, um, repeated, but a little bit of it was new. And so it's a Just worthy... to the faith thing, because that was big, because I, for eight years, I, I was the Catholic answer man on radio across yeah. the United States. So yeah. I'm heavily identified with that faith piece. So this is from Michael Sullivan. By the way, folks, I'm sorry I couldn't get all of them. I got, I, this morning when I was... Uh, Dr. Peterson, in light of your affirmation of the archetypal significance of the resurrection, you have expressed some ambivalence about its historical reality. J.R.R. Tolkien had long conversations in Oxford with C.S. Lewis in which Tolkien helped Lewis to understand that the story of Christ was the first archetypal myth that is not just true in a mythopoetic and psychological sense, but also true in the historical sense. That insight, helped by the grace of God, pushed Lewis over and he became a Christian. Where are you in, the, in this discernment process on the historical uh, nature of Christ and the, especially the resurrection? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Like, I do believe that there are places where the mythological and the... Now, it's interesting here because Peterson is very relaxed. Uh, this is a relationship he made before his his status rocket. And, and that's really important because what happens when you gain status quickly and when you gain such high status is you, you have... A real challenge of trusting those who come around you as to whether they love you or wish to use you. And so the relationships that he had, like with Jonathan Peugeot and with Patrick Coffin and with the others that he gained before his status rocket are really important to him because, in a sense, he knows he can trust them to a degree that he can't trust, let's say, someone like me who came along after. A literal touch. Mm -hmm. I mentioned one of those earlier, the idea that spoken truth, logos, Yep. creates habitable order out of chaos. I think that is literally and metaphorically true. I don't think you can, you can state the nature of being and the role that consciousness plays in it more accurately than that. And so it's metaphysically true, it's religiously true, and it's literally true all at the same time. And so there are times when that happens, and I don't know. See, this is the mystery to me, I would say. I understand what that means. I understand that there are times when the literal and the metaphysical or religious co-occur. Mm -hmm. And I can understand so that, that the literal is the foundation upon which the symbolic or the... Yeah. No, 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 Patrick. No. Because you just made a... <laughs> or is it the other way around? See, we don't know that. But that is the, that is the modernist bias that the that the literal is or the material is foundational and the symbolic is the de derivative we don't know that so anyway it's like the way i've been conceptualizing it is mm -hmm. it's as if the material reaches up towards the spiritual and the spiritual reaches down towards the material and now and then they touch and that's a miracle when that happens mm -hmm. it's a miracle when that happens and, and see yeah, I often talk, talk about Peterson coming up from the bottom, and that's true. And so that's when con one's conceptualization. But a more sac and I'm surprised the Roman Catholic answer man said it that way. And you know, everybody says stuff in, at one time or another, and you know, can certainly has to be kept in context with everything else he said and done, and uh, all of which I know nothing about. Yet, in a sacramentalist conception, it is also that the material is the glove upon the hand of the divine okay and 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 it is it is the it is the sense that we see through things to what is beneath them and and that when you have when you have the bread and the wine that this is his body this is his blood well what do we mean by that do we don't mean we don't mean that the 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 wheat molecules are transformed into molecules with human dna in it we mean that sacramentally something else is happening that that the that which is beneath is revealed now i know this is this is gonna a lot of you atheist folks it's gonna sound a lot like woo but this is this is a it is a truly strange world we live in and just like this 
you know, you say, well, I believe in science. Okay, there's there's more air between the, there's more, not air, because air's too big. There's more space between the particles than solid. Yeah, feels solid to me. Why? And 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 what color is that? Well, which which light rays is your is your eye picking up from this this color of wood? So reality is very strange, and and so the 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 and and embedded in what Peterson's whole project is is that what the logos is. See, the logos isn't logos isn't material. Yet logos brings order out of chaos. The, the logos you bring to bear on your room when you clean it. Now, when you clean your room, you don't just, you know, remove dust. You order it. You set things in place. And there's a schema. There's things that you don't even understand. You know, feng shui. There, there's things that you don't even understand. Things that you haven't had time in your life to 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 really even think through things that have been built into you from the way your mother decorated your house or a picture you saw in a magazine or and 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 going up spreading all throughout human society comes to bear in that moment in cleaning your room so it's not the foundation of the literal it's that the material comes into alignment with something else and, and that something else is not physical that's something else we don't quite understand it, but we recognize it and we're built and it's built into us and we respond to it and we live within us. When you organize your room, you bring that to bear in the room. And in fact, it's not even you all by yourself in isolation to yourself that is doing that. It is it is humanity and your culture and your parenthood and, and all of these things then get manifest in the material. All right. That's really what we're talking about here. And I do think that happens. Um, with regards to the resurrection, my, my, apart from saying what I just said, I would say that I need to think about that for about three more years before I would even venture an, an answer beyond what I've already given. Mm -hmm. it, now, Sam Harris is going to take this on, and I'll play that clip. On one hand, I deeply appreciate that because to work these kinds of things through mentally is critical. And we're going to see how Andrew Clavin thinks about this term in a little bit. Because there's very much there that I don't understand as well as I need to understand. Part of the reason, I, I did a biblical series last year yeah. and I got through Genesis. I, I thought I would get farther than that. You skimmed Genesis. <laughs> I, hey, I I get it. You had you had two out. You had fifteen sessions of two plus hours each. You get way more than a preacher gets often. But you, just like you yourself say, you you can't get to the bottom of this. Uh, but that isn't what happened. And I'm going to do Exodus next, and I'm going to walk through the biblical stories, and I hope I can get through all of them. Although I don't know if I'll live long enough. To <laughs> this is true. <laughs> do that. But I want to spend the same amount of energy on the story of the Christian passion as I have with those other lectures mm -hmm. to investigate exactly this sort of thing mm -hmm. because I know there's way more to that story that is that is available for analysis that I don't understand. Now, oh, I was going to do a separate video on this, but why not bring it in? Um, my and your friend Jonathan Peugeot this morning uh, made a tweet yesterday. Uh, let's see if we can get to the original tweet. Jonathan Peugeot tweets, paying attention to biblical scholars is as useful to the spiritual pilgrim as reading a book about agriculture is to someone who is hungry. I said, ouch. <laughs> It's important to have context for tweets. You cannot take, if you take Twitter too seriously, you should get off Twitter. Uh, would you say that by paying attention to a professor of art, it's useful to, to a seeker of beauty? Um, some, I'm sure. And there are, and I, I get Jonathan's point. There are some biblical scholars that are worth, that are worthless to listen to, but others that get into the field because of their love. Jonathan responds, I would say paying attention to the story pattern and image in art is more useful than learning about the chemical composition of the pigments and length of the strings in a violin. 
And so I get that point. But now what Peterson is saying here is he wants to study this. Well, how will you study this? Well, you're going to have to study it at all the different levels. And then I responded, I responded to, oops, let's get the right one. Oh, I'm still in here. I, re I responded to that in terms of there's something happened in the, something happened in the history of the West, in the Enlightenment, some really good things some really powerful things and some really negative things. And, and that's exactly what we're sorting through with Peterson here. And so he wants to study it. Well, the question is going to be, what tools are you going to bring to bear to study it? You're going to want to look at the historical. You're going to want to look at the historical grammatical. Gra grammatical. You're going to want to look at the symbolic. You're going to want to integrate all of these things because, again, the, the thing itself that happens in the resurrection N.T. Wright makes the point that when you look at these resurrection pack passages, what what they most seem to bear witness to is that people are really trying to figure this out. And, and in some ways, the only language we have for it, or the first language we can bring to bear or express it with or represent it with, is the phenomenological. Because that's all we have. And so what Paul does throughout his ministry and what we continue to do mentally is try to unpack this resurrection. Now again, we're not just talking about the moment. And again, when we get into Lewis towards later in this video, we'll get there. But it's not just the moment. It's it's what this means. And it is in fact, again, the 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 truth center of the human story. And as the last video I made brought in, this is the this is the missing chapter in the center that makes sense of the entire story. That's Lewis's perspective. All right, back to these two. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand what it means symbolically. I understand what the dying and resurrecting God means. It means something. Okay, he's got that. He understands what it means symbolically. And and now what do we mean by that? Well, that this that we can see the truth of this that is at the center of history, we can we can we can experience and participate in this truth in these tiny little versions of it. Uh, in my video, I talked about the little the little chewy cow toy that you give to a toddler that's teething. He'll put it in his mouth. He'll he'll play with it. He'll as he gets older, he'll have the little cow walking around and talking. Um, so that's the symbolic reduction of it in our lives. the The resurrection, the, the resurrection is symbolically might be I lose my job and but I trust God through it and then a resurrection my career is resurrected in a new way. Um, you know this the those are you know those are helpful symbolic representations of it. Phone calls. Something like. You pick up your cross, you voluntarily accept your suffering, you open yourself humbly to the correction of the world. Parts of you continually die as a consequence. All mm -hmm. the parts of you that need to be updated by exposure to truth and wisdom. Mm -hmm. And it's painful. You have to identify with the part of you that can be reborn continually through those micro deaths. That's basically what he did in the Easter video. Okay, so. So that's the archetypal pattern. Yeah. Well, the Christian claim is there's something going on that transcends that mere archetypal pattern, or that it it doesn't transcend the archetypal pattern. It is itself at the center of it that creates the archetypal pattern. It is the sun that shines. It doesn't transcend it. It generates it. Manifested itself in reality ultimately once. You know, and that was a claim that you. The singularity was once because it generated. Now, a little bit later, we're going to talk about time because time is important here. Because the center, there, there are various ways of understanding center. Um, with an explosion, the center is in the middle. And, and what we're going to see is that this, this event, this, this is the core of history, according to the Christian story, and that this 
flows out. Now, this is this is very tied to the day of the Lord, which is an Old Testament theme that if you've listened to any of my Old Testament Sunday school classes, I've spoken about quite a bit. This is very tied to the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is, in fact, the coming of God to his people uh, and the coming of God to this world. And, and I often talk about the day of the Lord. It, it works out funny in time because... There, there's finally an ultimate day of the Lord that comes that judgment day, we call it. We have, we have various different names for it. But there are pre-echoes. You see, what happens with an echo is that there's a clap and then it gets reverberated. Well, what happens, because time works differently in this, that we are hearing pre-echoes of the day of the Lord. In the fall of the Jerusalem, you have the pre-echo of judgment day. And, and in each of our different deaths, we, 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 we zip to Judgment Day. And that's a pre-echo of, of that great day that reverberates through history, but it reverberates in different ways through history. Because, again, it itself is not dependent upon time. And I'll get, I'll get to that a little bit later. Jung was, Carl Jung was actually quite, what would you say, um, sympathetic to. But I don't... I don't know enough about it to say anything more than what I've said psychologically. Yeah. And so I want to know more about it. You posted some of the correspondence between Father Victor White and C and, uh, and, and you, Jung. Yeah, and, on, uh, on psychedelics. On psychedelics. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've since looked up Father White a little bit more. This is the, uh -huh. the late English Dominican who died. I think he died within two years of Jung. The contemporaries, they had kind of a break, I think, in their relationship. And because I can see Father White's frustration that Jung is so, he's so suffused with almost. You kind of almost get mm -hmm. it, but there's some other piece kind of continually falling out the bottom. Um, I would love to see more of a rapprochement between the Jungians and the more Orthodox Christians, mm -hmm. because there's so much, you know, this is one thing I admire about what you do, is that you do not give glib answers. I remember watching you in an interview and it was an English, an older gentleman, he said, you know, Joel, do you believe in the resurrection? Mm. And you, I was probably a 25 second response because mm. I could see the, well, what do you mean by dead? What do you mean by resurrection? Are you trying to claim me for your own? Because I'm sure, yeah. you know, oh, he's a Baptist, he's yeah, a Mormon, yeah, he's whatever. Yeah, because um, yeah, one of the questions, one of the right responses to that is, what do you mean by that question and why are you asking it? Yeah. Right, because it's not just a straightforward question by any stretch of the imagination. It's the same thing that happens when people say, well, do you believe in God? It's like, First of all, like, I don't respond well to that question. It's sort of... He doesn't respond well to that question, and we're going to get into that because there's something going on there. It's, it's kind of like asking what you do in the bedroom. It's something like that. Really? For me. Or it's a bit like, boxy. Yeah, well, there's that, Be too. Yeah. There's that. It's manipulative as well, very, very frequently. You know, but I don't like... That's question, true, it is manipulative. I don't like to answer questions that... I can't feel solid about in my answer. And so I think my, my fundamental, I have two kind of fundamental answers to that question is like, the first is, well, what the hell business is it of yours? Mm -hmm. and, and like, it's not up to me to make that public. It's like praying in public, you know? Yeah, yeah. And well, my praying in public? I know something about praying in public. It's not a bad thing. It might be more intimate than what you do in the bedroom. Well, it might be, yes. It might be you. so. It's 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 you just don't get to know that, and you certainly don't get to know it in a one sentence answer. It's mm -hmm. like I could say, well, and then the other answer is, well, like I have this course, Maps of Meaning, and I lecture about that question for forty hours. Yeah. So the answer to that question is forty hours long, mm -hmm. and I can't condense it into a sentence. It's not condensable. Yeah. Like the forty hours is already a condense. Yeah, it's, it's know, allergic so, to a bumper sticker. Yeah, kind of right. Slogan. That's that's right. It Plus, if you say right. yes, I do, then they go, oh, he's he's one of us, mm -hmm. or yes, or I one do, of them. or or one of them. Mm -hmm. So everyone wants a, a mascot. They mm -hmm. don't want. And this is true. This is this is completely true. And we'll talk about that in a minute too. A complicated answer that maybe has some inbuilt ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I um, well, and with regards to the resurrection too, it's not even obvious what the gospels mean by the resurrection. Like it's not like it's a straightforward story. You know, Christ comes back, but people don't really recognize him. Yeah. And he's sort of got his, his old body, but not quite, because he's not recognizable. And then he appears to a lot of people, but then like the circumstances of, of what happens next are far from clear. And so there's this weird mingling in the gospels themselves of the psychological and the symbolic and the literal. 
it's a mingling again because it's the center and and all of those just like when you get a phd you get a doctorate in philosophy well, what does that mean well it's it's the center it, and philosophy was the the root out of which all these other disciplines grew and so that's why because it's right there at the middle it's all intermingled it's like the singularity it's it's all right there compact and it's about to explode into the world in churches and christians and people and hospitals and universities and and technology and and all aspects of the world in a sense the resurrection is the new singularity and and right there at you know within singularity plus plus 10 minutes it's all still mixed in and everyone's in shock not quite knowing what to do with it and it's going to get unpacked just like the universe gets unpacked after the singularity and mm -hmm. it's not i mean people have argued about what all that's what that story means mm -hmm. within the christian camp for yeah. 2000 years so <clears throat> and i've been talking to this guy jonathan pajo who's a Orthodox icon carbon. Phenomenal. Yeah, he's quite it, the character. Yeah, he, I, I'm, I'm, I'm even Catholic for my own reasons, but I think the Orthodox are kicking our ass. Yeah, yeah, hard. yeah. I, talk about a tribal thing. <laughs> yes. His stuff is so, it's so immediately arresting, his, yeah. especially his carvings. I'm sure he's a yeah. painter as well. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 yeah. So great. check him out, Jonathan. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, and Paggio has talked to me to some degree about the resurrection and about its complexities and mm -hmm. laid out the fact that the story in the Gospels is by no means simple. So to me, it's like it's a murky territory. It's extraordinarily complicated. There's symbolic utility in it. Certainly the idea of the dead dying and resurrecting God. That's an extraordinary utility. This is not something that we wield. This is something that wields us. The old idea. Jung's idea was, well, what? See, he kind of thought of Christ as someone who fully embodied the archetype. So see, and, and see, I would turn that around and say, no, he is the source of the archetypes. He doesn't fully embody them. They are not foundational and Christ derivative. It's the other way around. Mm -hmm. for, for Jung, it was really that it was really, in some sense, that the ideal and the actual had converged in Christ. He, he... They didn't converge; they began in Christ. It, it so really the, was the epitome of all the other pointers. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. That's and he said, mm -hmm. "Well, strange things happen when the archetype mm -hmm. manifests itself in the flesh." It's like, and and that's not really an almost answer either. You know, I mean, that that's. And Jung yeah, was yeah, a very... What you just said is not um, uh, not ambiguous. It's, no, it's pretty clear. No, no, exactly. And and I, I think that is a reasonable summary of Jung's position. But his position is so complex and so mm -hmm. nuanced that, and he was so go unbelievably profound. You know, like even his his response to psychedelic use. You know, beware of unearned wisdom. Oh man, that's a smart response. And beware then, of what? Unearned wisdom. Unearned wisdom. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And cheap, he said, Bonhoeffer would call it cheap grace. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure that's. I wouldn't put those two quite together. And then he said, here's the danger. And it's like, let's say that this is paraphrasing, but he said, well, let's say you have a psychedelic revelation. It's a true mystical experience. And uh, on second thought, maybe that is a pretty good idea of Bonhoeffer and, and Jung there in terms of unearned wisdom. Uh, I'll have to think about that more. So sorry for the, sorry for the impulsive response, which is in a sense what all my videos are. You see the distance between heaven and hell and you see your responsibility in relationship to those two entities. What makes you think you can tolerate that in your current condition, tolerate that knowledge? And I think that's an unbelievably wise response. So it's just too, see, the other thing that I really liked about Jung was that he was actually quite sympathetic to the merciful element of Catholicism. You know, although he was a Protestant, he, he knew quite clearly that one of the things that the Catholic Church offered to people was respite from the intolerable weight of knowledge of their own sins. It's like if to, you're a to, Protestant. The, ex, the, ex, the expulsion that happened. Uh, th this part of the conversation is interesting, but it's, I would, I would have, a, have a very interesting conversation with, with Patrick on, on Patrick and Peterson on their, their take on Protestantism. But now, that was that's classic Peterson. He gets to talk, and then then there's this then there's this 
conversation that he has with Andrew Clavin, and I, I wasn't wasn't able to track this down on Clavin's channel, but one of the um, one of the clip guys captured it, and that's that's where you can find this talk. And, and what happens here is very interesting because Peterson's go he's he's going through his stuff, he's going through sacrifice, and he's going through this, and he's going through that. Now I'm reading Andrew Clavin's memoir right now, and it's a it's a lovely book. It's a lovely lovely book, and. And, but he's frustrated with Peterson. He he is. This is an interesting interchange. And hmm. I, and I have to I have to say, and I I hope I hope this doesn't come across in the wrong way. I'm not a preacher, and I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. I, I heard a vid, I saw a video of you where you were asked directly, "Do you believe in God?" And you sounded so much like me about three years before <laughs> I was baptized that I I, I almost it almost made me laugh because you wanted to sort of keep it in the realm of ideas and yet there is this question and it's a powerful question for intellectuals like yourself because I think that if if intellectuals can't ultimately feel that they can't believe then I feel that there's no trickle down to everybody else uh, there's you know if there's no intellectual foundation for faith then basically there will be well, no faith so it's well, actually it also, an important question yeah well it is an important question and I've got two things to say about <laughs> Clavin's point isn't isn't far from Peugeot's point on on this business that to to unpack the resurrection intellectually is is the kind of of challenge that delights an intellectual because there's there's no end or depth to the path of discovery that you can take but that's not the only path because like well here's a stapler you know it's just a dumb stapler that someone once bought for the church years ago and um it's been sitting in my office for the 21 years i've been here was here when i got here you, you can explore this stapler you can explore this stapler or you can use it and and an engineer can reverse engineer the stapler and 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 a chemist can go into the properties of its materials and uh and an engineer can talk about the dynamics of the spring and and if the stapler goes in a landfill a thousand years from now someone might dig it up and and it's an heirloom and might ponder why did they have this and because all the you know well they took paper and they 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 added it together. Well, why did they have it on paper? And you know, so a historian could go throughout the stapler, but you can also use the thing. And and it's in it's in that sense that the the mechanic and the driver know the cars in different ways. And I was talking, I had a couple of conversations yesterday. Um, I don't know if either of them, if I'll post either of them, but you know, in Spanish you have saber and conocer. Um, an engineer might saber the stapler. But to use it is to conocer the stapler. And, and so, and, and this gets into Peterson's standing outside of the church. And this gets into Peterson as unauthorized exorcist. And, and, you know, some of his comments was that, well, the unauthorized exorcist, well, the unauthorized exorcist is exactly that. Jesus, in a sense, tells his disciples, leave him alone. You know, leave him alone. Let him, let him work his, let him work his stuff. And, and I think of that moment in, in the horse and his boy, when, when basically C.S. Lewis has, tells, I forget the names of it, but I, I remember that moment in the book where, where C.S., where, where, where Aslan basically says, as I deal with him is up to me. You follow me. Same thing happens in John 21. Uh, Peter is is a little annoyed, uh, or John, you know, you know, J Peter's a little annoyed at John, and and Jesus says to Peter, "If I want him to remain alive until I come again, what is that to you? Feed my lambs." And and so God takes each of us as individuals, and deals with us as individuals. So so Peterson, as the unauthorized exorcist, he's doing exorcisms. He's 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 
he's releasing people from demonic bondage right and left. And he's using Jesus' name. Yeah, he is using Jesus' name. But he's not doing it in the church. Okay? So he's, he's like the unauthorized exorcist. It, leave him be. He's doing stuff. Go ahead. You know, God will deal with Peterson as God deals with Peterson. And if you listen to him, he's there's the fear of the Lord is in Peterson. Uh, but there's some rebellion in him. And I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. So, oh, where was I? See, I lose myself. Clavin. Oh, yeah. And then this is the British guy that, that Patrick Coffin was talking about. And I played the first part of this video in my last video. And I'll play the second part here because it's germane. That's true. The literal fact. It's a phoenix. It's a phoenix story. Okay, that's the symbolism. But, but you but, like not about the actual fact, historical. Well, the thing is, is that just because that's true doesn't mean that's all that's true about it. See, and that's why he's an open agnostic. Because I also don't know. So here, for example, in order to stay alive, it's necessary to get the balance between death and life right in your psyche and your physiology. Because as far as we know, death keeps you alive. Your cells die and, and regenerate all the time. Dallas Willard had some really interesting thoughts on this, which I hope to mine more deeply, because Willard is such an interesting conversation partner in this journey. And if you die too much, then you die. And if you don't die enough, well, then you also die. You end up with cancer or something like that. You have to get the balance between death and life right in order to survive. I don't know... In order to survive in this world, in the age of decay. What would happen if you got the balance between death and life exactly right? And I don't know what the upper limits are to human possibility, and, and neither does anyone else. And human consciousness and human beings are capable of, we don't know what we're capable of, I suppose, is the final answer. And so I'm unwilling, for a variety of reasons, which I, which I can't explain, I, they're, they're, they're tangled up with experiences of the experiences that I've had that I can't, I, I can't, I can neither understand nor explain, but I'm unwilling to rule out, I'm unwilling to rule out the existence of heaven. I'm unwilling to rule out the existence of life after death. I'm unwilling to rule out the idea of universal redemption and the defeat of evil. Now, I, I know perfectly well that all those things can be well conceptualized metaphorically. I know the metaphorical conceptualizations, but I'm not willing to make the claim that those ideas exhaust themselves in the metaphor. Wow. So, and it, it's, you know, and, and I'm not in a position as of yet to articulate why I think that in a manner that would be anything other than a jumble of lateral thoughts. I have the thoughts, but they're not organized. And part of the reason I'm doing the biblical lecture series is to organize those thoughts. That's so, that's so interesting. I hope one day I'll have a chance to ask you more about that. All right. Now, in Sacramento, I don't know if I'm breaking any laws with this, but if I do, someone will tell me. In Sacramento, Peterson came in June, and one of the questions that was asked him was the resurrection. And so I did, I did record it with my, with my smartphone. So it's one of these little bootleg, low quality recordings, but here it is. In the past, you've said that you identify as being a Christian. Do you believe that Jesus... Uh, no, I, never, not, I don't think I actually said that right out. I... In the past, you've said that you identify as being a Christian. Do you believe that Jesus... Uh, no, I, never, not, I don't think I actually said that. Well... <laughs> Let's go to the videotape. Okay, um, quick question, are you a Christian? I suppose the most straightforward answer to that is yes, although I think it's, it's, let's leave it at yes. Well, there's... <laughs> <laughs> so... Okay. In the past, you've said that you identify as being a Christian. 
Do you believe that Jesus... Uh, no, I, never, not, I don't think I actually said that right out. I might have. <laughs> it's in your own clips. Okay, so maybe I did. <laughs> The second part is the important part. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died and physically resurrected from the dead three days later? This seems to come up a lot. It does. It does come up a lot. Um, I have the, I'm going to use the same answer that I usually use for that question, which is I don't understand enough about the doctrine to address the question. You know, like I'm making my way through the biblical stories. I... I did a 15 lecture series last year on Genesis, and I'm going to start up again in November with, with the stories in Exodus. Yeah, we're all happy to hear that until later he said, no, not November 2018, November 2019. Oh. See, and I, I don't, you think, well, that's a, that's a question. You should just be able to answer that question. It's like, no. That's not right, because that's a really, really complicated question. See, there's, a, there's an idea that's nested inside Christianity that whatever is divine is outside of time and space. It's really, truly outside of time and space. And that may this we're going to get into, because sometimes people share with me conversations that they've had with Peterson. And this has come up a few times with this question. And I... This prompted me to do some thinking about the resurrection and time. In the past, you've said that you identify as being a Christian. Oh, shucks. Do you believe that Jesus... Uh, no, I know. It's really, truly outside of time and space. And that makes any discussions of what occurs within that symbolic framework dependent on a series of presumptions about the nature of time and space. And I don't understand the context within which that story manifested itself well enough to address the question. Now, it's he's working on this. He, you know, he is. And you can tell because there's progress in the answers. And you might think, well, I'm just waffling. It's like, and could he possibly believe in the physical resurrection of the body? It's like, well, first of all, the world is a very weird place. And so, and it's much weirder than we think. And so... I can't answer that question because I don't know enough. I don't know enough to answer it properly. Because I also don't understand exactly what the doctrine is. You know, it's not like there's, there's a, a, a singular agreement on the resurrection story, even in the biblical narratives. There's four different accounts to begin with. And so, and I There's five, but I'm oh, not. In the past, and so, and I don't know enough about the accounts. Now, you know, you might think, well, why would you even, why would you even give any credence to the question? Because it seems so preposterous. It's like, fair enough, man, that's a good question. But here's part of the answer to that. I spent a lot of time studying religious texts. And mostly the, the, the biblical texts, but not only the biblical texts. And I've studied them in a strange way because I've studied the texts themselves, but then I've studied other domains of knowledge. And I've interpreted those stories through those other domains of knowledge. And the way I've done that is that I try to only rely on an interpretation that works in relationship to the story and in relationship to all those other domains of knowledge simultaneously. So it has to work as part of the biblical narrative, but it has to work biologically, and it has to work, and it has to work philosophically. Ah, shucks. So, so that's that's Peterson's. That's that's a key thing that Peterson does here when he's he's trying to get at it in in various from from the various aspects, and that's really critical. And now, now I would argue if you understand the the resurrection kind of like the singularity, where it is the center and out from it works, that makes sense because then you're going to be able to see it from different perspectives. Let's say something like my thought, an idea I have. Well, what are the ways that you can that you can see the idea that I have. You might see it in the words that I use. It might see you. You might see it in the 
in the things that I do with my body. You might see it in the relationships that I have with other people. You might see it in the writings. And so in order to get at that idea, you have to get at it from various perspectives. And I think Peterson is right there. But, but I think we have to kind of reverse, and this has to do with time, we have to kind of reverse the direction of this and see it more as, you know, I, I look at, I was amazed when the the Oklahoma City bombing. I remember when that bombing happened and immediately everyone thought Islamic terrorists. And no, it was Timothy McVeigh. And I was amazed at how the FBI and the forensic people could reconstruct that whole thing. They could, in a sense, make time go in reverse and put the truck back together and put that, that fertilizer bomb together and reconstruct the whole thing. And, and in a sense, that's what we do. We come at the resurrection from after the fact, from different perspectives, and we see, well, we can see its echoes. That's the symbolism. Those are the ripples in the pond. That, that's why, you know, that's why it's true. But now remember, there's something going on in time here. And this is, in a sense, the the center of the story even if it happens in the middle of the story because it reverberated out through and, and so in a sense you have the christian story it's a story so it's beginning middle and an end so the beginning obviously is in the beginning was the word and the word became flesh well that's also the incarnation so but but genesis is the beginning and the day of the Lord is the end of the story. And now there'd be more stories beyond that. But in the middle of the story is the resurrection, the crucifixion and resurrection. And that goes both ways through the story. And, and I know this is hard for us to imagine because we're pretty linear thinkers. Let's see if I can pick up where we were. This is not the... It's just texts. And mostly the... the biblical texts, but not only the biblical texts. And I've studied them in a strange way because I've studied the texts themselves, but then I've studied other domains of knowledge. And I've interpreted those stories through those other domains of knowledge. And the way I've done that is that I try to only rely on an interpretation that works in relationship to the story and in relationship to all those other domains of knowledge simultaneously. So it has to work as part of the biblical narrative, but it has to work biologically, and it has to work, and it has to work philosophically. It has to work all of those levels, of, and it has to be practically applicable. And and so you think about how you you decide whether something is real by using your senses, right? Well, if you see something, is it real? Well, usually, but not always. Well, what if you see it and hear it? Well, then that's probably more real. If you see it and hear it and touch it and smell it, well, there aren't very many things that aren't real that pass that test. It, the, 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 the reality manifests itself across multiple levels of analysis simultaneously. And so that's the strategy that I've been using to extract out an interpretation of the Bible. The reality manifests itself over multiple layers, okay? And again, what happens in the bomb in the Oklahoma City bombing is that reality manifests itself in a variety of layers. And so the bomb manifested itself in the shattered lives, in the loss of life, and that, that reverberates on through history. But that event only really moves forward because that's that's the agency that we have because we are in the middle of the flow with time. But but yet there were things that happened before that. There's the Waco the Waco incident that, in a sense, radicalized McVeigh and, and so on and so forth. But, but ripples for us pretty much only go in one direction. But I would, I would argue that the resurrection is, is the singularity and, and out it ripples. If I can pick this up or if it was lost. Oh, good. Biblical stories, which is actually my response to Sam Harris's objection, because Harris says, well, how do you know that your interpretation of the text is valid? You're not just reading into it. It's like, well, Sam, how do you know that your attempt to derive the world of values from the facts isn't just arbitrary? It's the same objection. So he's hoist on the same petard with his theory. But I have an answer to it, which is, I'm only willing to accept interpretations that work at multiple levels of analysis simultaneously. Now, one of the things I've found as a consequence of doing that is that 
The deeper I go into a religious text, the more truth reveals itself. And that isn't something I necessarily expected. And it's happened to me lots of times in my life. Like, first of all, I didn't really believe that there was anything of valuable value in the religious texts to begin with. And that was when I was a young man, say. But I learned that as I got deeper into the reality of good and evil, that religious language became necessary. You know, and I partly learned that from reading Dostoevsky, but, but I learned it, I also learned it in psychotherapy. When I was talking to my clients about truly terrible things that had been happening to them, like murderous things that, that unfolded over decades, like in, in the most pathological circumstances, a, a, a framework that didn't involve a discussion of good and evil didn't even touch the problem. And, and more than that, you know, I've noticed with people who have post-traumatic stress disorder that unless they develop a philosophy, of, which is often in some sense self-inflicted, because sometimes, especially soldiers who develop post-traumatic stress disorder, develop it because they see themselves do something they can't believe they did. And then they can't shake it. It's, it's blown their world into fragments. And they can't put it back together. And the only way they can put it together is to develop a sophisticated philosophy of good and evil. You know, and I... I mean, there, there's plenty of clinical evidence that describes post-traumatic stress disorder as this kind of fractionating, this fracturing. But I've had many, many soldiers come and talk to me. This happened latest, this happened in Iceland, June 8th, this guy from Idaho came to Iceland to see me because I was talking there. And he was in tears when he saw me and he, he, he'd been a serviceman, he had post-traumatic stress disorder. And he told me that my lectures on good and evil had helped him recover from it. That's part of that. That's Peterson as exorcist. And so I also learned that there's levels of reality that only religious language can lay out. That's what the religious language is for, actually. That's why it developed. And so the deeper I got into the stories, the more meaning revealed itself and it seemed bottomless. And so I've certainly seen that with the opening stories of Genesis. But then I also rediscovered it last year when I was going through the Abrahamic stories. The deeper I went, the deeper they got. And the deeper I went, the deeper they got. There was no bottom. And so I'm very loath to throw away the baby with the bathwater, let's say, or even the bathwater for that matter. It's like there's something to the idea of the dying and resurrecting hero. There's something to that idea. And I don't know how deep that idea goes. Like, you, I can treat it just symbolically, which is basically what I usually do. It's like, I, I, I can take a union approach, which is kind of like the approach of Joseph Campbell, and say, it's a deep idea that the hero... There you go, James. You mentioned Campbell. You know which James I'm talking about, James. You know I'm talking to you. Is that which sacrifices himself or part of himself or herself, for that matter, in the pursuit of the good. That's the dragon combat story. And then, look, I can give you an example of that, okay? So most of you, many of you, probably watched the second Harry Potter movie, right? And there's a magical castle, which you all accept without blinking an eye, by the way. <laughs> and it's full of magical children, which you also accept. That's okay, no problem, we can watch that. And underneath the magical castle, there's like a, an immense ancient system of pipes and, and sewers, and inside that lives a gigantic snake. That's the basilisk, right? And that echoes the Garden of, of, of Eden, by the way, with its snake. It's the same structure. And <clears throat> although you probably didn't think that when you watched the movie, but it doesn't matter. It's still there. And then when you see the snake, when you see the snake, it turns you to stone. And you accept that. It's like, yeah, well, of course, when you look at a giant snake, it turns you to stone. Everyone knows that. It's like, well, it's because if you're a prey animal and you see a predator, then you freeze. That's why you know that. It's like you know it all right. You've known it for 60 million years. Like you seriously know it. It's built into you. Anyway, so the, the snake ends up capturing the virgin. That's the St. George story. Ginevra, right? That's a variant of Virginia, which is obviously a variant of virgin, in case, in case you, did, you didn't notice that. Um, and so the snake takes the virgin, because that's what snakes do, and everyone knows that. And then what Harry has to do is go down into the depths to confront what he would least want to confront, and, 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 and have a great battle with this subterranean serpent. And, and he does that, and the serpent bites him, which is the encounter with evil, right? That's what causes post-traumatic stress disorder. And what cures him are the tears of a 
Of a phoenix, yeah, see, you guys know that. Of course, it what cures if you're bitten by a giant snake. Well, obviously, it's phoenix tears. It'll fix you. Everyone knows that. Well, the phoenix is a dying and resurrecting soul. It's a bird. It's an aerial spirit. And when it ages, it bursts into flame, and then it's reborn. And so the story that you watched was the story that that which dies and is eternally reborn is eternal medication for the poisonous bite of the ultimate serpent. So that's the story, man. It's like... So, so you, see, you see, in that story, there's built in the idea of death and resurrection, and actually the entire Harry Potter series, which is the battle against evil, in, in, in case you didn't notice. I mean, that's Voldemort, right? He's Satan for all intents and purposes, which makes the fundamentalist Christian assault on Harry Potter pretty comical in my estimation. But very true. in order for Harry to finally defeat Voldemort, he has to die and be reborn. That's how the book ends. It's like, and you know, I don't know, most of you bought that book for your kids, right? Seven, 600 page volumes to outline this story. You went to the movies and it's, and, and you buy it, you think, oh yeah, well that's a great movie. It makes gr great enough so that tens of millions of people spent billions of dollars on it. It's like, that's behavioral indication that something is going on. And 10 year old kids were reading 500 page books. It's like, why were they so engrossed by it? Well, you, you, can, figure, you can figure that out. It's like, what the hell's going on? It's like there's some massive cultural phenomena, ha phenomenon happening there. It's like, well, she's telling a story that everyone knows, but no one knows they know it. And so there is something to this idea of the dying and resurrecting hero. And the question is, well, what is there to it? And the answer is, the more you look, the more there is to it. And so I'm not willing to just, well, do you believe in the physical resurrection of Christ? It's like, I know why that question is being asked. It's like, but it's, it's a trap, that question. Either way you answer it, it's a trap. It's like, sorry, it's a deep problem. It's way deeper than, than we know. And so I'm not going to answer it casually. So. And then Ruben goes on to ask, boxers or briefs? And Peterson won't answer. It's hilarious. I should have just included that in the clip, but I didn't. But, but there it is. And, and so, you know, again, I thought that was a helpful addition. It's not different from a lot of the answers, but I thought it was a helpful addition. The element of time comes in, and then the element of multi-factor authentication comes in. Now, let's talk about Peterson a little bit. Clearly, his comfort zone is in the psychological and symbolic, and he keeps going back to that. And he's facing accepting the bitter suffering that is life, the cross. Something in you must die in order to transform, transcend, move forward like the phoenix. He's, he's very comfortable with that answer, and he gives it a lot. And then there's the hero's journey. But this is my point with that little video. Many would-be heroes are killed by dragons. And all are taken by death. It's just true. It's just true. And we love in our own power to be inspired by the story of the hero. But a reality of that is we fail the story. We fail to be the hero. And, and, and Peterson is, is motivating and he's inspiring people to be the hero. And so they're cleaning up the room and they're doing a lot of things and they're, they're, they're earning some victories. And that's wonderful. And, and who knows how much victory can be attained. But the age of decay always wins. It does. Yeah. I used to have... I was at the meetup the other day, and my son Jared goes to the meetup, and and some of the people didn't know he was my son, and it's kind of like, I used to look like that guy. I don't anymore. Now I look more like my father, except I have less hair than my father, thanks to my mother's father, so say people with genetic things to say. But here we are. We lose. And so, and so why the resurrection story? And, and what happens when we lose? And is there, see, see, the gospel is finally good news, not good advice. And, and Lewis is going to get into that in a minute when we get to Lewis. And then, of course, there's this interchange. If, if, there's you, a danger. If, you're, if you're in a parish of one yeah. or in a parish of 1,000 or a parish of 100,000, but not in the parish... 
that has anything in common with the, with the Bible thumpers in my country who think that Jesus is very likely coming back in their lifetime because he never died and he's gonna judge the living and the dead and there will be a resurrection and hellfire and all the rest. If that's not the game you're playing at all, own it. Watch him, watch him. The crowd, we talked about this in previous with the crowd, the dynamics. Pride, my friends, pride. Why, why, are, you, why, are, you, why are you all applauding about that? It's like, what, what do you mean own it? It's like, I already made my claim. It's like, I'm not playing a religious fundamentalist game. So what's all the applause about? So I don't understand that. And there you can see two thirds of the audience are Harris fans and one third are Peterson fans. Own it. It's like, I was as, listen, I was as clear as I possibly could be when I delineated my answer to the question People say, well, what do you mean by God? So, someone like, once, you someone's you once one, asked you if Jesus you was resurrected. You want a one-second answer? But no. Well, forget it, man. So Jordan, Jordan, I think Jordan can, wait a minute, uh, wait a minute. Hold on. I think we can actually... This is a what, complicated what, One problem. second. No, yeah. I, mean, I don't want to end on a, I don't want to end on a note of acrimony, but what? someone once asked you whether you thought Jesus was literally resurrected, and you said it would take me 40 hours to answer that question. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the kind of thing I'm responding to here. You don't need to do that if you have a clear-cut answer to that question. And I don't you, have a clear-cut answer to that question. And if you question. don't... It is hard to stand alone. It is hard to stand alone. And, and this is where Peterson gets vulnerable because he's standing with the IDW. Now, he might be in a status rocket, and for little people down below who don't have a lot of status... He might look up at the heights, but this is where C.S. Lewis talks about the inner ring. And you want to be in that inner ring. Here, here are your IDW partners. You don't want to be excluded from them. Peterson, it's these religious crazies that you seem to be inspiring and bread-pilling and on and on and on. And, and, and you're exposed now. You're, you're, you're not there with your... With your this is a fascinating video. And if you don't, that that connects with many other things that we still have to talk about. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I definitely. Mean, because because that it and, isn't and, obvious and, in the biblical account that Christ was literally resurrected. So it's not well, simple. This no, is not. We're all subject to peer pressure because here's the thing: we're herd animals, and and deep within us, we want to be in communion with those around us, and we don't want to be excluded, and we don't want to be shown the fool, and we don't want to be by those Bible thumpers and those those literalists who profess the Apostles' Creed and imagine that I believe in God the Father, Maker of heaven, heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, and who will come to judge the living and the dead. Now, maybe I'll have to do a thing on on, on some of N.T. Wright's thing on, on that question. No, 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 it, no, but if the question is, do you think he... Well, let's, let's put it probabilistically. I mean, anything's possible. I'll tell you that it's possible that he was physically resurrected. I mean, it's it's not... It's even possible... Wait a second, I didn't With respect say to quantum mechanics. Was. The point is... I said it, it would take me 40 hours to answer the question. I didn't say that he was. Well, go ahead. How's this for an answer? Almost certainly not. Okay. What's, what's, what's wrong with that answer? You want... <laughs> I, I think I... I think... What, what, what did Peterson say there? What's wrong? You want... <laughs> I, I think I... This is where, my friend, you need a church. This is where you need a team. This is where we, and, and, and this also, this dynamic also makes the crucifixion of Jesus so poignant because he's alone, he's abandoned, he's betrayed. And it's in that moment that we as human beings find ourselves most weak. And this is the reason why we we value those stories where the hero, the hero is under intense pressure of every kind. I think I know what's wrong with that answer. Sam smells blood. Um, 
it's a, it's a it's a fine answer, and people have been giving that answer for a very long period of time. But the idea doesn't seem to go away. Okay, but, so, that, but, and but that's reason, evidence of what exactly? I don't know. Okay. Well, I can tell you one thing it's an evidence of. All there's right. a deep idea. Then, let, a let, deep this be, let this be the doorway to our next three-hour conversation. Sure, sure, sure. Not, sure, so, uh, sure. We, have, we have ten minutes left. Okay. Oh, um, well then, let's answer that question in ten minutes. <laughs> so, wait. I, I want you to trust me here. You, 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 for whatever reason, decided I should moderate, so I want you to trust me. Uh, for one thing... You, you, you have been listen, doing yeoman's I mean, like, work. Sam, I really Thank would you. like to answer that question, like, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out... People seem to think that I'm trying to evade the question. It's like, I'm not evading the question, I'm trying to figure it out. It's a really... People have been arguing about this for 2,000 years. It's like it's not but, simple. But that's a, sim that's a symptom of the effect of religious dogmatism for 2,000 years. No, it's not. Okay, it's so partly a symptom of that. It's also partly a symptom of the, the idea. The resurrection of Jesus is clearly an important question, but you've raised a much bigger and more pressing question for the audience, which is whether or not God cares whether they masturbate. So, <laughs> And from there they go on to the end of the video, and you can watch that. But... Peterson is continuing to work on this, and I think he will continue to work on this. This is this is this is this is not going to let him go. This is not going to let him go. He's seen too much. He knows too much. It's going to keep working on him. Okay, peer pressure is coming from. Well, he's wrestling with it. How time figures into it. We're going to talk about that. Learning about doctrine. What the claims actually are. He's a very fast reader. He's going to keep reading. But this is, this is, there's only a hundred years of psychological literature. There are thousands of years of literature about this. He doesn't have enough time in his life to read it all. You have the strange nature of the stories. He's going to have to deal with that and contend with that. The role of, the work we need to do, he, he references that. His his gospel is very much, you know, straighten out your room, pick yourself up, face the dragon. You know, what happens when the dragon kills you? What happens when what you've done in the past disqualifies you? What happens with the guilt and shame? I'm not sure that the Protestants are quite as... Um, I'm not sure that the, quite, the Protestants are quite as uh, defenseless in terms of dealing with our guilt and shame as some of those comments might have imagined. What does it mean? Now, they're right in the tribalism, the shibboleths. This comes out of the Old Testament where a certain only a certain tribe could say a word in a certain way, and that's how they knew who was in and who was out. There was a day when nearly everyone in the West believed in God, and I, I see this often with 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 Christians, they say, oh, if, if we only believed in God. Well, you know what? 500 years ago, everybody believed in God. That didn't mean the world was perfect. And and in that sense, Peterson is dead on right. This this surface level of, of assent can be very shallow. That's true. Everyone used to believe in God and the world wasn't perfect. And there are many who say, I can't believe in the physical resurrection, but I live quite, but live quite moral lives. And that's the Tao that Lewis is talking about. And there are others that say, I believe in the resurrection, and their lives are a mess. This is one of the things that, that we're going to have to discover is, is what's the relationship between creed and life? Now, now, there was a comment in one of my videos where someone said, I don't believe in a creedal church, and that really gave me pause, and I wrote a rather long answer to that comment. But because I thought about it, and I, basically my answer was, show me a non-creedal one, because creeds keep sneaking in. They keep developing. Now, why is that? Because how do words function? Well, well, we need words, I think, to orient ourselves. We use words to orient ourselves with each other. And that little peer pressure moment when Peterson, that, that's really the only time that Harris really had Peterson on his heels. That's the time that Harris most significantly had Peterson on his heels. because, And this is the thing, because Peterson does not stand with an army behind him. He's alone, and so he's vulnerable. 
But in the church, you stand with an army behind you. You stand with the cloud of witnesses. You stand with the saints in glory. You stand with that motley crew of Bible thumpers and fundamentalists and Orthodox and Catholics and 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 this body of Christ, which in this world is is strange and odd and and sometimes half baked and and strewn with with compromise and misconception and all kinds of things. And, and Lewis talks about that in, in the screw tape letters because this is the church that we see and and screw tape talks to Wormwood and says, you know, yet they don't see the terrible thing that we see, an army with his banners arrayed, the hundred forty four thousand in the book of Revelation. What do you gain by being with the church? Do you have association with sinners? Yes. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He's not afraid to associate with sinners. Now, often the church has betrayed that at its peril and at great cost. But the church is for sinners. G.K. Chesterton, I like getting into hot water. It gets me clean. So, but what is the relationship between these creeds and these doctrines and the body? We don't really finally understand that but we know that there is i've been going this this work that's been bringing me to different areas in california geographically that's allowed me to to start these new meetups i i sit there for these classical exams and we ask pastors sunday school questions basically and i think well what's going on in this room what what's the relationship between the words and the lives and and it's all mixed up and it's all mysterious and we're really bad at it and it's all true but we have no other way to orient ourselves but to say i believe in this and and then to have a church around me that says and i'm going to hold you to it and i think sometimes i want to be held to it and sometimes i don't well that's me but the church says, I'm going to hold you to it. And and in a sense, I come to the church and say, please hold me to it. Because sometimes I fear in the darkness what I've seen in the light. And sometimes in the darkness, I forget what I've known in the light. And what words and beliefs and creeds and subscription does is say, I believe in the resurrection. Put me on a stage with with lots of peer pressure in front of a hostile crowd, in front of really smart challengers, and where will I go? Now, now sometimes we can take we can take cover in the in the fortress of self righteousness, but that's a poor fortress. In fact, it's a it's the it's the it's the house of straw. Because my righteousness is nothing. Because I am a sinful, broken human being that has no righteousness. The coffee break ladies are asking me about the parable of this of the of the crooked manager in Luke 16, and I, I still stand behind what I think is the best answer, with the, which is Kenneth Bailey's. That the thing about the crooked manager is, is he doesn't bank in his own righteousness. He banks in his Lord's. I know that I will face dragons I cannot beat, and that's why I have a champion. That's why I have a savior. That's why I have someone whose righteousness is more than my own, whose perfection is more than my own. That's why I need him. And so finally I can say there's a whole bunch of things I don't know. But him I know. And the creeds and the words orient me in that universe. And within the body of Christ, it's by those creeds that I am held accountable. And, and I'm still trying to sort out how this works. But, but that's it. We use words to orient us. And, and though we have a slippery relationship with profession of faith and behavior, it, it seems to matter in terms of how we negotiate our relationships with one another. It helps us orient each other in this matrix. Now, I wanted to go through some of these. This is going to be a long video. I wanted to go through some of these Bible verses because it's very interesting. Many times I've mentioned so often Jesus basically says we will be judged by what we do. And this is very Petersonian. This is very pragmatistic. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, on that day, that's the day of the Lord, that's judgment day, the day that, that we all experience in pre-echoes. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then, he, then I will tell. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. 
See, this is one of the funny things about Jesus is that people say, well, Jesus was nice and kind and tolerant. Makes Jesus sound like a doormat. Read the Gospels. He's no doormat. He said, oh, we, 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 we were known and seen as miraculous people. And Jesus says, but you didn't have a relationship with me. Well, what on earth does that mean? What does it mean to have a relationship with him? And, and now I think this is something that the evangelicals got right. But, but the question is, how is that relationship mediated? And this is a long conversation throughout church history because is it mediated through the institution of the church? That's, that's essentially you know, a big fight in the Reformation. And Luther wanted to come around and say, no, it's mediated by word and spirit. And, but, the, but then that leads into all this fragmentation of the church. And so we're, you know, in many ways, it's like the two sides of the tapestry. And, and, and the tapestry, of the, the side of the tapestry of the church that we see here today is a mess. But on the other side, I believe we'll see the brilliance of it. And again, I'm going to get into Lewis with that. Boy, this is going to be a long video. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Now, this is a centurion. This is a member of the Roman occupying force. This is someone that the Jews should hate. These are American soldiers in Iraq in 2005. These are German soldiers in the Netherlands in 1943. Jesus entered Capernaum. A, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terrible. Well, who's your servant? Is he a slave? Is he, a, is, he, a, is, a, is he an enslaved Jew? Are you holding my countrymen? See, now this is part of the reason that Jesus got in trouble with just about everybody, because a good group of the people said, you know, this centurion, he's part of the occupying force. You should kill him and liberate his servant. But now, as you read some of the other synoptics, the centurion was also good to the people. And it's, and it's that way in which reality is far stranger than fiction. It isn't just black hats and white hats. It isn't privileged and unprivileged. It, you know, it isn't, it isn't all these facile ways we try to discriminate people. Good and evil, run, the line runs through every human heart, as Solzhenitsyn says. He's dead on right. He's, he's a Russian. He should know that. The centurion replied, Lord... I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. There's no self-righteousness about him. But just say a word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority this, with soldiers under me. I tell you, go. And he. I tell one, go, and he goes. And the other, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. You have power? Yeah, he has power, and he knows how power works. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. What? Are you betraying your nationality, your tribe, your ethnicity, your, your countrymen, your national group of origin, the people of God? I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is how Jesus often frames. Well, what is, what is salvation? What is eternal life? Well, it's a feast. Jesus offers these, these pictures, these images, these, these symbols. It's the feast of the patriarchs. This is, this is the final celebration of the grand human story. And Jesus is saying, some of you here won't get there. But others that you can't imagine are unholy or unworthy, they will get in before you. Well, how? Well, how does that work? And we try to systematize it. No, no system. Jesus. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And again, perdition is the same. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go. Let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. It's probably Capernaum. Some men brought him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, your sins are forgiven. On the faith, on the virtue of the faith of the friends, Jesus forgives the man's sins. 
Now the teachers of the law are paying attention. They understand the system. And, and this is an amazing thing. Again, I'm going to say this. By virtue of the faith of the friends, this man's sin is forgiven. And you might say, well, well, this is what the, at this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your heart? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. Then the man got up, went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to man. What's going on there? Remember I talked about truth as that bottom floor? We talked about the resurrection as the singularity. It's the center. And so what is it between healing and sin? What's the relationship there? That, that's a complicated question, and I could have a long conversation with someone on that because that hasn't always been worked out well by the church. But there's, there's something about sin, and, and we don't want to go down the story of Job that says, well, Someone who has everything that they've always wanted is obviously blessed by God. Now, the Bible says you can't, it is not that simple. But, but Jesus sees the paralyzed man and on the basis of the faith of the friends tells him your, your sins are forgiven. It's like, wow, the man didn't repent. The man didn't profess anything. But on the basis of the faith of the friends, the man's sins are forgiven. And oh, by the way, your paralysis is healed too. What's the relationship between the sins and the paralysis? And, and the man himself brought no righteousness into the, into the exchange. It's the faith of the friends. It's their sacrifice that saves the man from his sins. Well, how can that be? Well, it's the sacrifice of our friend who saves us. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Well, what, why should they have repented when they seen the miracles? What do you mean they had repented? Well, what Jesus is saying here is that what the miracles were doing, again, these aren't just tricks. These weren't just validations. This isn't just look at me, send me money, subscribe to my YouTube channel, give money to my church. No, Jesus is giving them samples of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying... Eyes were not made to be blind. Ears were not made to be to be deaf. Mouths were not made to be mute. Legs were not made to be lame. I'm going to bring the kingdom here, and you're going to see it. And when you see it, there's an expectation of gratitude and response that is demanded. And what Jesus finds is that they're not doing it. They're just like... The son, the, the younger son in Luke 15, they say to the father, I want your stuff, but I don't want you. Isn't that exactly what materialists say? God, I want the stuff, but I don't want you. And I'm going to try to use technology to enslave your stuff and take it for myself. Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Now this is a, this is a big biblical theme. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. Look at how archetypal, how symbolic that is. If the miracles that had been performed in you had been performed in Sodom, which is the paradigmatic city of rebellion in the Old Testament, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Well, what can that mean? Now, those of you who, like me, are in the church, this ought to give us terror. Because it ought to reveal how much we have been given. And so how much will be required of us. And it ought to give us patience, generosity, mercy for anyone not within whatever ecclesiastical circle you define yourself as being within. Because, well, we've been given much. They haven't benefited from it. 
And and this is part of what really makes me enjoy Peterson. He, he's not been given this, and and God is doing something through him. Now, is it clear? No. Is it muddled? Sure. But I look at Peterson's success, and I I, I feel just condemnation on my performance as a Christian. I've been given way much more than him. And his ministry is far greater. He's the unauthorized evangelist. So I can understand the disciples looking at the unauthorized exorcist and saying, I want to shut him up. And Jesus is saying, no, you leave him alone. I'll deal with him. You're with me. Think about yourself as Bethsaida and Capernaum. And think about yourself in terms of what has been given to you and what is required. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wine and learn and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this, for that is what you are pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this, I think, is where Clavin comes in. And We had a Down syndrome man who joined the church years ago, and I still hear about his profession of faith from elders who were in that room because they said they had never heard such a profession of faith. This is from a man with Down syndrome. He believes. He believes with everything in him. Well, how? Why? He, he can't answer all the questions now. But, it's, but, but this is the mystery of faith. You can, you, can, you can be the smartest person in the world, and if you make your intelligence your idol, never get there. And you can be a simple person that just gives yourself to him and God can do amazing things through you. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also with the Son of Man will be to this generation. The queen of the south will rise in at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now someone greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repent at the preaching of Noah, or Jonah, and now someone great, something greater than Jonah is here. Can't wait, wait to hear what Peterson does with these passages. Because... This gets into Lewis's trilemma. Well, Lewis is caught in that trilemma because he's attracted to Jesus, but Jesus says the craziest things. He's greater than Solomon. He's greater than Jonah. He's greater than the patriarchs. Read the Gospel of John. I am, he says about himself. What are you going to do with Jesus? You have every reason in the world to say, I'm not going to pay any attention to you. Okay, you do so at your peril. And Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Now, be careful with that word saved, okay? Don't box that in too tightly, as everything in this video has been saying. He said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able and that will not be able to. Isn't this the guy that says, ask and it will be given, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open? Yes. How can it be both? I don't know, but I know that it is. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Again. Another one of these sayings of Jesus that's like, it's about your relationship with me, but, 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 but how can I have a relationship with you? How can I have a relationship with you? Well, through the church? Through the word and spirit? Yes. 
every human relationship is unique because both individuals are unique. Every relationship with Jesus will have a unique aspect, but they'll also have patterns. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast of the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. We ought not to judge each other too quickly because we don't know. Because there is one judge and his judgment is true. Now, Peterson is resistant to the tribal game. I know why they want me to answer that, believe in God or the bo bodily resurrection, but Peterson has some pride. He has a rebellious streak in him that I think one way or another he's going to have to deal with. I'm sure he's dealt with it all his life, but he's a, he's a stubborn, he's still, that stubborn little kid is still in him. He's interested in God, Jesus, and Christianity and the Bible, but he won't associate with the church. He's a therapist who's never been to therapy. I remember when this came up at one of our meetups, we looked at each other like, even for licensing, isn't that a requirement? And yet Peterson basically says, I've read all the books. What do I need therapy for? Is that what he'd say to a patient? There's a, there's a deep pride there. And I'm not singling him out. I've got deep pride. Augustine saw pride as the cardinal sin. Now, now, when you say a cardinal sin, it basically means the root sin, the sin out of which other sins grow. And, and so here, Peterson on stage with, with Brett and Sam, he's backed into a corner, and, and he doesn't like it. He doesn't like getting pushed. He's, he's, that, he's that same little kid. It's still in him. It's our, each of us as little kids, it's, it's all still in us. We're just covered up by more layers and sophistication. I want to talk about God and time. You see, God and time is interesting. By physics, we, we know we live in time space. And this was a huge thing that Einstein helped teach, that, that time is a product of, of space and it varies in terms of gravity and, I mean, and speed as you get towards the speed of light and all this kind of stuff. It's like weird time is time is part of nature and and we've always known this but we've never quite known what to do about it we we can imagine standing outside of time think about how you stand with respect to your past you remember your past in in terms of a flat wall it's all in a sense present to you in a limited way your past is. I can think about myself at five. I can think about myself in kindergarten. I can think about myself in high school. I can think about myself in the Dominican Republic. I can think about myself in many different times. Now, memory is a little foggy and not real good, but if, if, if we could see the past like God sees the past, if we could see the past in a sense like we sort of see the present. Now, consciousness gets into this too. Well, that is, I think, an imaginative way in which we can understand how God sees time. It's all present to him, just like the past is present to us. Another way of thinking about that is the difference of reading a book when you're reading through a story in a book. It's all sequence, serial, and consciousness, but you can page through the book and jump in and out of the book at different places. And, well, in a sense, in the book, well, time is different. And, and there's an interesting relationship between time and consciousness. And we all experience this. Time speeding up and time slowing down. The commute that you've made to work every day, you don't even remember when you get to the end of it. Now, that is a function of memory and the mind and all of that, too. But so time and consciousness. Well, how does this, how does this impact the resurrection? Now, the funny thing about the resurrection, you can read N.T. Wright on this, is that by the time we meet the Jewish people in the second temple, the first century, the, 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 this idea of the resurrection had already come in. You can find it in the, in the, at the end of the book of Daniel, that, that, that they have somehow figured out that, been revealed to them, that God is not going to just throw away the losers of history. 
the ones who are killed by the beasts. And, you know, read the book of Daniel. Beasts rise up and they kill. Read the book of Revelation, which is a New Testament redux of Old Testament prophecy. The people of God lose and lose and lose and lose and lose again. And instead of just keeping to side with the winners, they, they begin to say, there's another strain that's going through history here. And there's a resurrection where, where those where, where heroes who were not strong enough to beat the dragon finally are vindicated for standing up to the beast and being slain. Those who sacrifice themselves, again, sacrifice is key with Peterson, those who sacrifice themselves are vindicated, not just in story, the Greeks had that, but in flesh and blood. It's a better story. So the Jews imagined that there'd be a resurrection at the end of time, but then it comes in the middle. And, and that's what, you know, the Apostle Paul has to try to figure out, as, as does John and Peter and, and, and the Apostles. And, and the New Testament tells time in terms of ages and its overlapping time. There's the present evil age of sin and death, I call it the age of decay, and that there's the age to come. And it's inaugurated in Jesus' resurrection. This is the life of the age, or or in, in Joanine books, eternal life. And, and they overlap. And the reason they overlap is because, as Lewis said, it gets written into the, the, the center of the story. The key to the story gets added in. And that's why the New Testament happens. And that's why in the book of Revelation, for example, they rewrite the prophetic material in the book of Revelation. In a sense, the book of Revelation is in some way a recapitulation of the, of the Old Testament, in, in some ways of the entire Old Testament. So, so what happens then is that the end comes in the middle. That's the resurrection of Jesus. That's the day of the Lord. The darkness, the earthquake, all of this stuff that the Gospels talk about, the resurrection, the crucifixion of Jesus, that's all day of the Lord symbolism. So the end comes to the middle. And so where are then Christians living? Christians are living between the beginning of the end and the end of the end, and that's where you get into this latter-day language, the end times language, because the end has begun. Well, you say, well, that's thousands of years ago. Oh, okay. Well, if you believe in evolution, how long has life been around? What's 2,000 years? It's nothing. Yeah, but it's long to us. Yeah, but what is us again? Peterson says we've got this a priori structure within us that is filtering everything around us, and we've inherited this. So what is us? And then even when we go into the future, when we ask the question, what is us? We mean like homo sapiens. Well, why do we think in these terms? Well, we don't understand. But but the resurrection has begun, and it's begun in Jesus. And, and that's why Christians get so dogged about the reality of this resurrection and not it being Gnostic or spiritualized away, but that it's concrete, it's physical. Because that's the only way it makes sense. And it's the only way it makes sense in the story. So, so the body is present today. We've got the now and the not yet. Now, do Christians bring in the kingdom? Well, this is actually one of the real fights in terms of the social justice warrior thing. Because there's this Christian faction of the social justice warrior that goes here and says, it's our job to bring in the kingdom. Well, you know, if you're bringing in the kingdom, you're bringing in hell too. We saw that in the 20th century. You see that in Brave New World. If you bring in one, you bring in the other. Post-millennialism before World War I, it was all about that. Read the Oneida story. Fascinating story. Um, this is a religious version of Steven Pinker. Now, Jordan Peterson struggles up the hill to the, to the city of God. His sights are set lower than the others, but he, he doesn't have his eschatology worked out yet. And in fact, the whole Christian tradition doesn't have, hasn't come to consensus on eschatology yet. Do Christians bear witness to the kingdom? That's my preferred. You will be my witnesses, the beginning of the book of Acts, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses, because that's what we do. We testify, Gospel of John. Do Christians await escape, rapture? I, I don't think the dispensational premillennialists have it right. I think that's a new addition, but I think it's a corruption. Okay, C.S. Lewis, Miracles of the New Creation. 16. Miracles of the New Creation 
Beware, for fiends in triumph laugh for him who learns the truth by half. Beware, for God will not endure for men to make their hope more pure than his good promise, or require another than the five-stringed lyre, which he has vowed again to the hands, devout of him who understands, to tune it justly here. See Patmore, The Victories of Love. In the earliest days of Christianity, an apostle was first and foremost a man who claimed to be an eyewitness of the resurrection. Only a few days after the crucifixion, when two candidates were nominated for the vacancy created by the treachery of Judas, their qualification was that they had known Jesus personally both before and after his death, and could offer first-hand evidence of the resurrection in addressing the outer world. Acts 1.22 a few days later, St. Peter, preaching the first Christian sermon, makes the same claim. God raised Jesus, of which we all, we Christians, are witnesses. Acts 2.32 In the first letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul bases his claim to apostleship on the same ground. Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord Jesus? 1.9 As this qualification suggests, to preach Christianity meant primarily to preach the resurrection. Thus people who had heard only fragments of St. Paul's teaching at Athens got the impression that he was talking about two new gods, Jesus and Anastasis, i.e. resurrection, Acts 17.18. The resurrection is the central theme in every Christian sermon reported in the Acts. The resurrection and its consequences were the gospel or good news which the Christians brought. What we call the Gospels, the narratives of our Lord's life and death, were composed later for the benefit of those who had already accepted the Gospel. They were in no sense the basis of Christianity. They were written for those already converted. The miracle of the resurrection and the theology of that miracle comes first. The biography comes later as a comment on it. Nothing could be more unhistorical than to pick out selected sayings of Christ from the Gospels and to regard those as the datum and the rest of the New Testament as a construction upon it. The first fact in the history of Christendom is a number of people who say they have seen the resurrection. If they had died without making anyone else believe this Gospel, no Gospels would ever have been written. It is very important to be clear about what these people meant. When modern writers talk of the resurrection, they usually mean one particular moment, the discovery of the empty tomb and the appearance of Jesus a few yards away from it. The story of that moment is what Christian apologists now chiefly try to support and skeptics chiefly try to impugn. But this almost exclusive concentration on the first five minutes or so of the resurrection would have astonished the earliest Christian teachers. In claiming to have seen the resurrection, they were not necessarily claiming to have seen that. Some of them had, some of them had not. It had no more importance than any of the other appearances of the risen Jesus, apart from the poetic and dramatic importance which the beginnings of things must always have. What they were claiming was that they had all, at one time or another, met Jesus during the six or seven weeks that followed his death. Sometimes they seemed to have been alone when they did so, but on one occasion, Twelve of them saw him together, and on another occasion about five hundred of them. St. Paul says that the majority of the five hundred were still alive when he wrote the first letter to the Corinthians, i.e. about 55 A.D. The resurrection to which they bore witness was, in fact, not the action of rising from the dead, but the state of having risen, a state, as they held, attested by intermittent meetings during a limited period, except for the special and in some ways different meeting vouchsafed to St. Paul. This termination of the period is important, for, as we shall see, there is no possibility of isolating the doctrine of the resurrection from that of the ascension. The next point to notice is that the resurrection was not regarded simply or chiefly as evidence for the immortality of the soul. It is, of course, often so regarded today. I have heard a man maintain that the importance of the resurrection is that it proves survival. Such a view cannot at any point be reconciled with the language of the New Testament. On such a view, Christ would simply have done what all men do when they die. The only novelty would have been that in his case we were allowed to see it happening. But there is not in Scripture the faintest suggestion that the resurrection was new evidence for something that had, in fact, been always happening. 
The New Testament writers speak as if Christ's achievement in rising from the dead was the first event of its kind in the whole history of the universe. He is the first fruits, the pioneer of life. He has forced open a door that has been locked since the death of the first man. He has met, fought, and beaten the king of death. Everything is different because he has done so. This is the beginning of the new creation. A new chapter in cosmic history has opened. I do not mean, of course, that the writers of the New Testament disbelieved in survival. On the contrary, they believed in it so readily that Jesus, on more than one occasion, had to assure them that he was not a ghost. From the earliest times, the Jews, like many other nations, had believed that man possessed a soul, or nefesh, separable from the body, which went at death into the shadowy world called Sheol, a land of forgetfulness and imbecility where none called upon Jehovah any more, a land half unreal and melancholy, like the Hades of the Greeks or the Niflheim of the Norsemen. From it shades could return and appear to the living, as Samuel's shade had done at the command of the Witch of Endor. In much more recent times there had arisen a more cheerful belief that the righteous passed at death to heaven. Both doctrines are doctrines of the immortality of the soul, as a Greek or modern Englishman understands it, and both are quite irrelevant to the story of the resurrection. The writers look upon this event as an absolute novelty. Quite clearly, they do not think they have been haunted by a ghost from Sheol, nor even that they have had a vision of a soul in heaven. It must be clearly understood that if the psychical researchers succeeded in proving survival and showed that the resurrection was an instance of it, they would not be supporting the Christian faith, but refuting it. If that were all that had happened, the original gospel would have been untrue. What the apostles claimed to have seen did not corroborate nor exclude and had indeed nothing to do with either the doctrine of heaven or the doctrine of Sheol. Insofar as it corroborated anything, it corroborated a third Jewish belief, which is quite distinct from both these. This third doctrine taught that in the day of Yahweh, that's the day of the Lord that I was speaking of, of Yahweh, peace would be restored and world dominion given to Israel under a righteous king. Now that day of the Lord is very complicated in that it is it is very contrasted. It is both a day of, there's actually an old hymn in the blue Christian reform, day of judgment, day of glory. It's both of those things together. And it's, it's so in, in the book of Revelation, when, you know, when the Lord returns, the, the great and the small of the earth cry to the mountains to fall on them, because who can save us from the face of the one on the throne and from the Lamb? And and the day of the day of the Lord is both terror and glory. And and this is exactly the sense we have of the presence of the Lord in the Old Testament. And, and Peterson, if he gets into Moses in the cleft of the rock, why can't we see God? Well, killed with killed by beauty. It it overwhelms us. It makes us the light is so true and penetrating we see ourselves for how we are and we want ourselves destroyed and that when this happened the righteous dead or some of them would come back to earth not as floating wraiths but as solid men who cast shadows in the sunlight and made a noise when they tramped the floors awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust said isaiah and the earth shall cast out the dead twenty six nineteen what the apostles thought they had seen was, if not that, at any rate a lonely first instance of that. The first movement of a great wheel beginning to turn in the direction opposite to that which all men hitherto had observed. Of all the ideas entertained by man about death, it is this one, and this one only, which the story of the resurrection tends to confirm. If the story is false, then it is this Hebrew myth of resurrection which begot it. If the story is true, then the hint and anticipation of the truth is to be found not in popular ideas about ghosts, nor in Eastern doctrines of reincarnation, nor in philosophical speculations about the immortality of the soul, but exclusively in the Hebrew prophecies of the return, the restoration, the great reversal. Immortality simply as immortality is irrelevant to the Christian claim. Now we're going to get into that phrase, the great reversal, a little bit later with Lewis in The Great Divorce. 
There are, I allow, certain respects in which the risen Christ resembles the ghost of popular tradition. Like a ghost, he appears and disappears. Locked doors are no obstacle to him. On the other hand, he himself vigorously asserts that he is corporeal, Luke 24, 39 to 40, and eats broiled fish. It is at this point that the modern reader becomes uncomfortable. He becomes more uncomfortable still at the word, Don't touch me, I have not yet gone up to the Father. John 20, 17. For voices and apparitions we are in some measure prepared, but what is this that must not be touched? What is all this about going up to the Father? Is he not already with the Father, in the only sense that matters? What can going up be except a metaphor for that? And if so, why has he not yet gone? These discomforts arise because the story the apostles actually had to tell begins at this point to conflict with the story we expect and are determined beforehand to read into their narrative. We expect them to tell of a risen life which is purely spiritual in the negative sense of that word. That is, we use the word spiritual to mean not what it is, but what it is not. We mean a life without space, without history, without environment, with no sensuous elements in it. We also, in our heart of hearts, tend to slur over the risen manhood of Jesus, to conceive him, after death, simply returning into deity, so that the resurrection would be no more than the reversal or undoing of the incarnation. That being so, all references to the risen body make us uneasy. They raise awkward questions. For as long as we hold the negatively spiritual view, we have not really been believing in that body at all. We have thought, whether we acknowledged it or not, that the body was not objective, that it was an appearance sent by God to assure the disciples of truths otherwise incommunicable. But what truths? If the truth is that after death there comes a negatively spiritual life, an eternity of mystical experience, what more misleading way of communicating it could possibly be found than the appearance of a human form which eats broiled fish? Again, on such a view, the body would really be a hallucination. And any theory of hallucination breaks down on the fact, and if it is invention, it is the oddest invention that ever entered the mind of man, that on three separate occasions this hallucination was not immediately recognized as Jesus. Luke 24, 13 to 31, John 20, 15, 21, 4. Even granting that God sent a holy hallucination to teach truths already widely believed without it and far more easily taught by other methods, and certain to be completely obscured by this, might we not at least hope that he would get the face of the hallucination right? <laughs> Is he who made all faces such a bungler that he cannot even work up a recognizable likeness of the man who was himself? <laughs> it is at this point that awe and trembling fall upon us as we read the records. If the story is false, it is at least a much stranger story than we expected, something for which philosophical religion, psychical research, and popular superstition have all alike failed to prepare us. If the story is true, then a wholly new mode of being has arisen in the universe. The body which lives in that new mode is like, and yet unlike, the body his friends knew before the execution. It is differently related to space and probably to time, but by no means cut off from all relation to them. It can perform the animal act of eating. It is so related to matter as we know it that it can be touched, though at first it had better not be touched. It has also a history before it which is in view from the first moment of the resurrection. It is presently going to become different or go somewhere else. That is why the story of the ascension cannot be separated from that of the resurrection. All the accounts suggest that the appearances of the risen body came to an end. Some describe an abrupt end, about six weeks after the death. And they describe this abrupt end in a way which presents greater difficulties to the modern mind than any other part of Scripture. For here, surely, we get the implication of all those primitive crudities to which I have said that Christians are not committed. The vertical ascent, like a balloon, the local heaven, the decorated chair to the right of the Father's throne. He was caught up into the sky, Oranos, says St. Mark's Gospel, and sat down at the right hand of God. He was lifted up, says the author of Acts, and a cloud cut him off from their sight. It is true that if we wish to get rid of these embarrassing passages, we have the means to do so. The Marcan one probably formed no part of the earliest text of St. Mark's Gospel, 
and you may add that the ascension, though constantly implied throughout the New Testament, is described only in these two places. Can we then simply drop the ascension story? The answer is that we can do so only if we regard the resurrection appearances as those of a ghost or hallucination, for a phantom can just fade away. But an objective entity must go somewhere. Something must happen to it. And if the risen body were not objective, then all of us, Christian or not, must invent some explanation for the disappearance of the corpse. And all Christians must explain why God sent or permitted a vision or ghost whose behavior seems almost exclusively directed to convincing the disciples that it was not a vision or a ghost, but a really corporeal being. If it were a vision, then it was the most systematically deceptive and lying vision on record. But if it were real, then something happened to it after it ceased to appear. You cannot take away the ascension without putting something else in its place. The records represent Christ as passing after death, as no man has passed before, neither into a purely, that is, negatively spiritual mode of existence, nor into a natural life such as we know, but into a life which... Now, now Peterson, in other places too, but also in the, in the Patrick Coffin video, comments on, well, the stories just seem to stop. And I, I think part of that is because Peterson, well, if he were Orthodox or Roman Catholic or belonged to a liturgical tradition, because unfortunately many of the non-liturgical traditions don't know what to do with the Ascension Day either, and that is betrayed by their theology, which tends to have, well, we go to heaven when we die as, as the final state instead of resurrection and new heaven and new earth, which N.T. Wright would correct them if they'd read him. It, the stories just seem to stop. Well, the point is of the book of Acts that the stories don't seem to stop because the spirit comes and then the spirit takes up the narrative. Now that's tricky for us because again, our entire scientific framework wants to organize and manage control and, and colonize. And the point of this is in a sense the, you know, if, if Jesus talks about the parable of Jonah, I'll talk about the parable of Jordan. Because the parable of Jordan is this. Well, God works through this man, and the man, you know, all, all of the Peterson stuff, It's all of those questions, they're all right there. Is God doing something? In my opinion, he certainly is. Oh, some of you will differ. I know that. But opinions are things that we own ourselves. I'll own that one. So here it is. And, well, the Spirit blows where it wills. It doesn't wait for our permission. You know, but into a life which has its own new nature. It represents him as withdrawing six weeks later into some different mode of existence. It says, he says, that he goes to prepare a place for us. This presumably means that he is about to create that whole new nature which will provide the environment or conditions for his glorified humanity and in him for ours. The picture is not what we expected, though whether it is less or more probable than philosophical on that account is another question. It is not the picture of an escape from any and every kind of nature into some unconditioned and utterly transcendent life. It is the picture of a new human nature and a new nature in general being brought into existence. We must indeed believe the risen body to be extremely different from the mortal body, but the existence in that new state of anything that could in any sense be described as body at all involves some sort of spatial relations and in the long run a whole new universe. That is the picture not of unmaking but of remaking. The old field of space, time, matter and the senses is to be weeded dug and sown for a new crop we may be tired of that old field god is not and, and this is where i think some eschatologies fall short because the the resurrected body of christ himself is our orientation it's recognizable but not recognizable and the scars remain but the scars don't remain as wounds as much as glory and, and badges of the new creation. And again, when I get into the great divorce, in terms of how our scars are healed, well, this is it. Because it, it's a funny thing that friends get together and talk about 
old times and even old battles. And there's a sense of that that old battle now takes on new forms. It it, it becomes gravity, which draws the which draws the soldiers together, and it's it's sense such, which is Luther's world word for this melancholy longing joy, and not Luther's word, Lewis's word. And yet the very way in which this new nature begins to shine in has a certain affinity with the habits of old nature. In nature, as we know her, things tend to be anticipated. Nature is fond of false dawns, of precursors. Thus, as I said before, some flowers come before true spring. Some men, the evolutionists would have it, before the true men. So here also we get law before gospel, animal sacrifices foreshadowing the great sacrifice of God to God, the Baptist before the Messiah, and those miracles of the new creation which come before the resurrection. Christ's walking on the water and his raising of Lazarus fall in this class. Both give us hints of what the new nature will be like. In the walking on the water, we see the relations of spirit and nature so altered that nature can be made to do whatever spirit pleases. This new obedience of nature is, of course, not to be separated even in thought from spirit's own obedience to the father of spirits. Apart from that proviso, such obedience by nature, if it were possible, would result in chaos. The evil dream of magic arises from finite spirits longing to get that power without paying that price. The evil reality of lawless applied science, which is magic's son and heir, is actually reducing large tracts of nature to disorder and sterility at this very moment. And that's the point about technology and nature, that we take power over nature as we take it we take it as a slave master when we ought to be nature's husband and i do not know how radically nature herself would need to be altered to make her thus obedient to spirits when spirits have become wholly obedient to their source one thing at least we must observe if we are in fact spirits not nature's offspring then there must be some point probably the brain, at which created spirit even now can produce effects on matter not by manipulation or techniques, but simply by the wish to do so. If that is what you mean by magic, then magic is a reality manifested every time you move your hand or think a thought. And nature, as we have seen, is not destroyed, but rather perfected by her servitude. The raising of Lazarus differs from the resurrection of Christ himself, because Lazarus, so far as we know, was not raised to a new and more glorious mode of existence, but merely restored to the sort of life he had had before. The fitness of the miracle lies in the fact that he who will raise all men at the general resurrection here does it small and close, in an inferior, a merely anticipatory fashion. For the mere restoration of Lazarus is as inferior in splendor to the glorious resurrection of the new humanity as stone jars are to the green and growing vine, or five little barley loaves to all the waving bronze and gold of a fat valley ripe for harvest. The resuscitation of Lazarus, so far as we can see, is simply reversal, a series of changes working in the direction opposite to that we have always experienced. At death, matter which has been organic begins to flow away into the inorganic, to be finally scattered and used, some of it, by other organisms. The resurrection of Lazarus involves the reverse process. Now, now remember, in the miracles of the old creation, time is key in many of these miracles. Water to wine is something that happens in the wineries of Northern California. Slowly, Jesus has it happen in an instant. So, so when Peterson is wrestling with the resurrection in time, there's reason for that as process the general resurrection involves the reverse process universalized a rush of matter toward organization at the call of spirits which require it chaos and order are it it is presumably a foolish fancy not justified by the words of scripture that each spirit should recover those particular units of matter which he ruled before for one thing they would not be enough to go round we all live in second-hand suits, and there are doubtless atoms in my chin which have served many another man, many a dog, many an eel, many a dinosaur. Nor does the unity of our bodies, even in this present life, consist in retaining the same particles. My form remains one, 
though the matter in it changes continually. I am, in that respect, like a curve in a waterfall. But the miracle of Lazarus, though only anticipatory in one sense, belongs emphatically to the new creation, for nothing is more definitely excluded by old nature than any return to a status quo. The pattern of death and rebirth never restores the previous individual organism. And similarly, on the inorganic level, we are told that nature never restores order where disorder has once occurred. Shuffling, said Professor Eddington, is the thing nature never undoes. Hence we live in a universe where organisms are always getting more disordered. These laws between them, irreversible death and irreversible entropy, cover almost the whole of what St. Paul calls the vanity of nature, her futility, her ruinousness. And, and this, when I listen to, say, Sam Harris, and he talks about his Edenic world of reason, I think, it's nothing compared to this. Because for all of your reason, you reorganize matter through power over. But only the king of nature can alter nature so radically. A ruinousness. And the film is never reversed. The movement from more order to less almost serves to determine the direction in which time is flowing. You could almost define the future as the period in which what is now living will be dead and in which what order still remains will be diminished. But entropy, by its very character, assures us that though it may be the universal rule in the nature we know, it cannot be universal absolutely. If a man says, Humpty Dumpty is falling, you see at once that this is not a complete story. The bit you have been told implies both a later chapter in which Humpty Dumpty will have reached the ground, and an earlier chapter in which he was still seated on the wall. A nature which is running down cannot be the whole story. A clock can't run down unless it has been wound up. Humpty Dumpty can't fall off a wall which never existed. If a nature which disintegrates order were the whole of reality, where would she find any order to disintegrate? Thus, on any view, there must have been a time when processes the reverse of those we now see were going on, a time of winding up. This is, in a sense, the cosmological argument. Winding up. The Christian claim is that those days are not gone forever. Humpty Dumpty is going to be replaced on the wall, at least in the sense that what has died is going to recover life, probably in the sense that the inorganic universe is going to be reordered. Either Humpty Dumpty will never reach the ground, being caught in midfall by the everlasting arms, or else when he reaches it, he will be put together again and replaced on a new and better wall. Admittedly, science discerns no kings, horses, and men who can put Humpty Dumpty together again, but you would not expect her to. She is based on observation, and all our observations are observations of Humpty Dumpty in midair. They do not reach either the wall above or the ground below, much less the king with his horses and men hastening towards the spot. The transfiguration or metamorphosis of Jesus is also, no doubt, an anticipatory glimpse of something to come. He is seen conversing with two of the ancient dead. The change which his own human form had undergone is described as one to luminosity, to shining whiteness. A similar whiteness characterizes his appearance at the beginning of the book of Revelation. One rather curious detail is that this shining or whiteness affected his clothes as much as his body. St. Mark indeed mentions the clothes more explicitly than the face and adds, with his inimitable naivety, that no laundry could do anything like it. Taken by itself, this episode bears all the marks of a vision, that is, of an experience which, though it may be divinely sent and may reveal great truth, yet is not, objectively speaking, the experience it seems to be. But if the theory of vision or holy hallucination will not cover the resurrection appearances, it would be only a multiplying of hypotheses to introduce it here. We do not know to what phase or feature of the new creation this episode points. It may reveal some special glorifying of Christ's manhood at some phase of its history, since history it apparently has, or it may reveal the glory which that manhood always has in its new creation. It may even reveal a glory which all risen men will inherit. We do not know. It must indeed be emphasized throughout that we know and can know very little about the new nature. 
The task of the imagination here is not to forecast it, but simply by brooding on many possibilities to make room for a more complete and circumspect agnosticism. It is useful to remember that even now senses responsive to different vibrations would admit us to quite new worlds of experience, that a multidimensional space would be different, almost beyond recognition from the space we are now aware of, yet not discontinuous from it, that time may not always be for us, as it now is, unilinear and irreversible, that other parts of nature might someday obey us as our cortex now does. Now again, that time business is important, and we're going to get into that, but how, in fact, will the ravages of history be healed? Now for us, history and time can only go one way. It is useful not because we can trust these fancies to give us any positive truths about the new creation, but because they teach us not to limit in our rashness the vigor and variety of the new crops which this old field might yet produce. We are therefore compelled to believe that nearly all we are told about the new creation is metaphorical, but not quite all. That is just where the story of the resurrection suddenly jerks us back like a tether. The local appearances, the eating, the touching, the claim to be corporeal, must be either reality or sheer illusion. The new nature is, in the most troublesome way, interlocked at some points with the old. Because of its novelty, we have to think of it, for the most part, metaphorically. But because of the partial interlocking, some facts about it come through into our present experience in all their literal facthood just as some facts about an organism are inorganic facts, and some facts about a solid body are facts of linear geometry. Okay, I'm going to stop there. This new creation. The time business is interesting. Because Tolkien gets at this, too, in The Lord of the Rings. Uh, but Sam laid back and stared with an open mouth, and for a moment, between bewilderment and great joy, he could not answer. Well, what, what is this? This is the resurrection of Gandalf, which happens in The Lord of the Rings. At last he gasped, Gandalf! I thought you were dead. And you'll notice again in Lord of the Rings, Gandalf is... I have trouble recognizing him. <coughs> but then I thought, I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What has happened to the world? This is a little resurrection piece in The Lord of the Rings. In The Great Divorce, he's talking with um, um, MacDonald, the ghost of MacDonald, or the, the new creation of MacDonald, George MacDonald. But I don't understand. Is judgment not final? Is there really a way out of hell into heaven? It depends on the way you're using the words. If they leave that gray town behind, it will it will not have been hell. Uh, to any that leave it, it is purgatory. And perhaps he had better not call this country heaven. Not deep heaven, ye understand. Here he smiled at me. Ye can call it the valley of the shadow of life. And yet at those who stay here, it will have been heaven from the first. And ye call it these sad town in the town yonder, the valley of the shadow of death. But to those who remain there, it will have been hell, even from the beginning. I suppose he saw that I looked puzzled, for presently he spoke again. Son, he said, ye cannot in, in your present state understand eternity. When Anadose looked through the door of the timeless, he brought no message back. But, he, but ye can get some likeness of it, if ye say that both good and evil, when they are full grown, become retrospective. This is time moving in reverse. Not only this valley, but all their earthly past will have been heaven to those who are saved. Not only the twilight of that town, but all their life on earth too, will then be seen by the damned to have been hell. That is what mortals misunderstand. They say of some temporal suffering, no future bliss can make up for it, not knowing that heaven, once attained, will work backwards and turn even that agony into glory. And of some sinful pleasure, they say, let me have let me have but this, and I'll take the consequences. Remember Peterson, nobody gets away with anything. Little dreaming how damnation will spread back and back into their past and contaminate the pleasure of sin, of the sin. 
Both processes begin even before death. The good man's past begins to change so that his forgiven sins and remembered sorrows take on the quality of heaven. The bad man's past already conformed to his badness and is filled only with dreariness. And that is why, at the end of all things, when the sun rises here and the twilight turns to blackness down there, the blessed will say, We have never lived anywhere except in heaven, and the lost, we were always in hell. And both will speak truly. It's a fascinating passage, and I have some sense of it. I see it in people's lives when... All is, all is shadow, and all becomes shadow, and, and time starts moving in reverse. And this is a fascinating thought by Lewis, and, you know, this is Lewis's thought, so this is, this, he's speculating, he's, he's trying to get his head around, but, but here's, the, here, here's the advantage of standing within the tribe, in that, you can do so from within the safety of the tribe. Dostoevsky. Now, now this, this great famous quote from the brothers Karamazov, what's so interesting is that it's actually spoken by Ivan. And as Peterson says, Dostoevsky often puts the strongest arguments in the words of the rival. I seem to be on the right path, don't I? Yet would you believe it? In the final result, I don't accept the world of gods, and although I know it exists, I don't accept it at all. It's not that I don't accept God, you must understand. It's the world created by him I don't and cannot accept. Let me make it plain. I believe like a child that suffering will, that suffering will be healed and made up for, that all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage, that the despicable fabric of the impotent and infinitely small Euclidean mind of man, that in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity, of all blood that they've shed, that it will, ma that it will make it not only possible to forgive it, but justify all that has happened with men. But though all that may come to pass, I don't accept it. I won't accept it. Even if parallel lines do meet, I see it myself. I shall see it and say that they've never that they've met, but I still won't accept it. That's the root of, that's what's at the root of me, Aloysia. That's my creed. I am in earnest in what I say. I began to talk as stupidly as I could on purpose, but I've led up to my confession, for that's all you want. This is in a sense Lewis's vision fulfilled in Ivan. Ivan is always damned. Aloysia always saved. You don't want to hear about, you didn't want to hear about God, but only to know what the brothers you love, um, you love lives by. And, and so I've told you. Ivan concluded this long tirade with marked and unexpected feeling. See, now belief isn't subject to the will. If you want to change a belief, you need to change your elephant's herd. Your rider can't think your way into a new reality apart from action and community. So what is a Christian? Someone who trusts Jesus more than they trust him or herself. It's not, you don't have to be brilliant. You don't have to be smart. It's the core of life that, that, that anyone from the simplest to the most profound. In fact, it's it's often hardest for the profound. And this is why Jesus in, in Matthew and Luke praises God for giving giving faith to the simple. Now, now that doesn't mean that faith is unreasonable or unintellectual. It's just that we're not smart enough to build the tower up to it. The Tower of Babel always fails. We destroy it ourselves. Trust is seen in living. Doctrine becomes reason to believe. Obedience becomes the shape of gratitude. Well, those of you who like long videos, this was a long one, two and a half hours. I hope it's helpful. Let me know.